The uh, international perspective on state governance in the internet, uh, and we're very fortunate to have Assistant Secretary Strickling with us, and Bertrand de la Chapelle, who came in for a lovely weekend in D.C. <laughs> on Thursday, uh, and he's seen probably you know lovely pictures of snow, which we may we may get to see later. So um, we are going to open this panel with a couple minutes um, with Assistant Secretary Strickling and some comments, and then we're going to go to a dialogue. Great, thank you, Shane. Um, so I guess I'm looking at the uh, only group of people in Washington, D.C. that don't own a sled or cross-country skis or snowshoes. Is that the deal? Either that or you're just totally dedicated to this topic. Um, but I suspect it's because you don't have a sled. Um, in any event, I want to uh, thank Tim Lorden and the organizers of State of the Net for inviting me back to speak this year. Um, obviously, the snowstorms had a... Uh, put a damper on attendance here this year, but since I only live a few blocks away, I didn't really have an excuse uh, for not coming, other than the fact I did have a face-to-face -face conversation with 11th Street a few <laughs> days ago, um, which resulted in a number of stitches to my forehead and some possible cracked ribs, but nonetheless, I uh, uh, showed the spirit and arrived here this and afternoon for this panel. Huh? And still going. And still right. going, right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, unbreakable. Yeah, I wish. Um, so anyway, our topic for this session is the state of internet governance from an international perspective. And in that regard, it's only fitting that the uh, panelists who had to travel the greatest distance to get here, Bertrand, uh, was able to make the trek from Paris to be here this afternoon. Um, others, including some of the locals like Cheryl and Sally, have, are snowed in and hopefully some will be able to join us uh, remotely as the panel goes on. Um, so to introduce this topic, I wanted to provide some perspective on recent developments with respect to internet governance and then provide uh, my own list of issues and questions that I think will form the basis of discussions on this topic in 2016 and beyond. Um, simply put, the overarching issue with respect to internet governance is who gets to decide how the internet runs as reflected in the continuing debate between advocates for multi-stakeholder decision making and those who want the key decisions made by governments in multilateral settings. The Obama administration has consistently supported the multi-stakeholder model of internet governance. Um, and as we begin this new year, we have reason to be optimistic about the future of internet governance, but we must remain vigilant and push back against challenges by those who want only governments to decide. We've come a long way since December 2012 when the ITU's WICKET conference ended in disarray in Dubai. At this conference, some nations argued that the new realities of today's communications and information networks required an overhaul of international regulations to give governments more power. The United States and others argued that these same realities and the proliferation of stakeholders that had emerged in the internet economy demonstrated how unfit government-only institutions such as the ITU are for dealing with these issues. Coming out of the wicket, it was clear that many countries in the developing world were open to finding solutions to these problems through means such as multi-stakeholder processes, but they just were not comfortable enough with this form of governance to join in. And our challenge back then was to work hard to increase the number of countries that support the multi-stakeholder model. Since the wicket, we have seen greater acceptance of the multi-stakeholder approach in developing countries. In March 2014, we announced our intent to transition our stewardship of the IANA functions to the global internet community, and our announcement sparked the engagement of stakeholders around the world to develop the transition plan, and everyone has to be pleased by the energy, dedication, and level of effort that's been put forth so far in the development of the transition plan. In April 2014, Brazil hosted the successful Net Mundial Conference, the conference brought together a wide range of stakeholders, including technical experts, civil society groups, industry representatives, and government officials who agreed that internet governance should be built on democratic multi-stakeholder processes. At the June 2014 ICANN meeting in London, Minister Liu Wei of China indicated some level of appreciation by his government for the multi-stakeholder process, particularly as demonstrated at Nen Mun Niao. And then at the end of 2014, the ITU's plenipotentiary conference in Busan concluded with a consensus outcome that the ITU should remain focused on its current mandate and not expand its role into internet and cybersecurity issues. We saw this momentum carry over into 2015. 
Internet stakeholders made impressive progress last year on the IANA transition plan and have managed to work through some very difficult issues on improving ICANN's accountability. India, the world's largest democracy, announced its support for the multi-stakeholder approach to Internet governance at the June ICANN meeting in Buenos Aires. And then in December, the international community provided another boost to the multi-stakeholder model when the United Nations high-level meeting on WISIS agreed to extend the mandate of the Internet Governance Forum for an additional 10 years. This extension, which is twice the length of the IGF's original five-year mandate, will provide needed certainty to the IGF donor community. Also, at the same meeting, the United States and other like-minded countries successfully negotiated language in the final outcomes document that affirms the primacy of the multi-stakeholder approach to developing the information society and defeated proposals from Russia to create a new United Nations-based intergovernmental legal framework for Internet policy making. Yet despite this progress, it's clear that there are still those who oppose our efforts to maintain an open internet and the free flow of information across the globe. In fact, the same week the United Nations reaffirmed its support for the multi-stakeholder approach, China held its own World Internet Conference in Wuzhen, at which the government appeared to return to its previous stance that internet governance was the responsibility of governments. The statement issued at the end of the conference was notable for not including any mention whatsoever of the multi-stakeholder approach. So as we begin 2016, what do we see as the landscape for internet governance this year? Well, countries around the world will continue to grapple with the challenges of the open internet. We all accept and take for granted that the internet has produced dramatic economic growth and incredible innovation as well as providing an important platform for free expression around the globe. But at the same time, we have seen the growth of sophisticated malware and other cybersecurity threats, and an increasing need to protect the privacy of internet users and to combat the online theft of intellectual property online. These challenges have tested government's ability to balance these important interests with the equally important need for openness. In their attempts to do something to protect their citizens and businesses, governments sometimes rush to put up digital walls between their countries and the rest of the world by proposing or instituting data localization laws, as well as imposing limitations on data storage, data transfer, data processing. Such moves, however, threaten to undermine the central idea of the Internet as a global, connected network of networks. And in responding to these concerns, governments sometimes lose sight of the power of the multi-stakeholder process to find solutions to these problems. So with that lead-in, here are what I see as the leading Internet governance questions for 2016. First, will we complete the IANA stewardship transition this year? There's a lot writing on this question. First, of course, we want to preserve and strengthen the multi-stakeholder coordination of the domain name system through ICANN. But second, these efforts to date represent the largest multi-stakeholder process ever undertaken. Not only will ICANN be stronger as a result of this effort, but a successful outcome here will serve as a powerful example to the world that the multi-stakeholder model can solve difficult issues regarding the Internet. Two. Will the multi-stakeholder model expand to meet the needs of the developing world? With its new 10-year mandate, the IGF is poised to play a major role here if the global Internet community takes up the challenge. This will be also be an important year to determine if the NetMundial initiative can become a useful resource. It has been handicapped from the start by its failure to make a compelling case to attract the support of the business community and the Internet society. Its initial funding runs out this summer, so it does not have much more time to demonstrate what value it can provide. Three, where is China in the Internet governance debate? It has participated in ICANN. It even served on the first two accountability and review teams. And Minister Liu Wei has said supportive things about the multi-stakeholder model in the past. But does the recent Wuzhen conference indicate that China intends to go its own way on these issues, more in line with its recent statements about the cyber sovereignty of nations and the need for multilateral, not multi-stakeholder internet governance? And finally, can the multi-stakeholder model be used effectively to address internet policy issues that come up in the context of privacy, cybersecurity, and other issues where governments historically have had a mandate to act? 
For our part at NTIA, we have been utilizing the multi-stakeholder process the past few years as an alternative to traditional legislation and regulation, and we will continue to do so as we complete our work this year on drones, cybersecurity, privacy, and copyright issues. In our final year in office, the Obama administration will remain active and engaged around the globe, whether it is participating in the IGF, at ICANN, or in any other venue where these issues will be debated and discussed. Every one of us has a stake in ensuring the continued growth, job formation, and wealth creation that an open internet brings, and this is why I urge all of you to work to preserve and grow this vibrant platform of innovation, economic growth, and free expression. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, and, and Assistant Secretary Strickland, I want you to know you have well-wishers on Twitter. They say, feel better soon. <laughs> Uh, now that I'm done, I already do. <laughs> Bertrand, do you want to uh, kind of give us this idea of what you've been working on and any comments on Assistant Secretary Strickling's comments? Yes, thank you, Shane. Um, good afternoon. My name is Bertrand Lachapelle. For those uh, who probably don't know me, I come from France. I used to be the French thematic ambassador in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for Internet Governance Issues. Then I've been a member of the ICANN board, and since 2012, I am the director and co-founder of an initiative called the Internet and Jurisdiction Project, which, as the name implies, is dealing with the tension between the cross-border internet and national jurisdictions. Um, the purpose of the initiative is to basically bring the different actors together to implement this multi-stakeholder dialogue approach uh, bringing together in the last few years more than a hundred different entities from governments, civil society, major internet platforms, um, technical operators, international organizations, and academia. So what I would like to, 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 to place this discussion uh, under is the topic of internet governance is a very broad one. Um, I want to focus on one that has uh, fortuitously been uh, highlighted by Max Schrems in his previous uh, intervention, i.e. the topic of jurisdiction, which is in another way, it's the question of how do you apply sovereignty in um, international internet-related matters, and basically how do you apply national laws on a cross-border system that has brought so many uh, benefits. In order to do this, I would like to make a <clears throat> a distinction that I am um, very fond of, which is uh, the distinction between what would be called the governance of the Internet and governance on the Internet. Uh, in a nutshell, when we talk about governance of the Internet, I would include in this everything that is related to standards, to uh, the management of the domain name system, the attribution of IP addresses, basically everything that relates to the logical layer of the Internet. What I want to talk more about here is what could be labeled the governance on the Internet, i.e. everything that is related to the uses of the Internet. And if you look at the definition of Internet governance that was uh, embedded into the documents at the end of the World Summit on the Information Society, the definition basically says that Internet governance is about the development by the different stakeholders of principles, norms, rules, decision-making procedures and programs that shape, <coughs> sorry, the evolution and use of the Internet. So Internet governance is about the evolution and use of the Internet, and governance on the Internet is the second part. In this regard, uh, it is easy to say that there is this tension between a cross-border system, technically, and a patchwork of national jurisdiction, which is basically what the international system is about, separate sovereignties and non-interference in the affairs of others. There is a structural tension uh, there. And with the growth of the internet, on the one hand, we have the immense benefits that it has brought. And on the other hand, as has been uh, mentioned by the Department of Justice earlier today, there is a growing danger of misuse and abuses of the system. And so we're confronted fundamentally with two big questions. One is how to preserve the global nature of the internet and at the same time make sure that national laws are appropriately respected. And the second one is how to provide the tools to fight abuses and misuses while at the same time keeping the protection of human rights and procedural guarantees that we all enjoy. And so this problem is not going to diminish. Quite on the contrary, it's going to increase because as the internet 
is being used by more and more people, permeates more and more activities. We are bringing together um, diversity of actors and national laws and references, be it cultural, religious, uh, political, whatever, that will make the problem and the risks of conflicts only uh, bigger. And so in this environment, <clears throat> what is at stake is how to develop cooperation mechanisms across borders that are as transnational, as distributed, and as participatory as the internet itself. And in this regard, I would like to highlight one element. We are in, um, in an environment where the traditional tools of international cooperation are really struggling with this thing. Um, as Larry Strickling was mentioning, international cooperation, like by the way of multilateral treaties, are bumping into the very basic fundamental notion of the separation of sovereignties. And the separation of sovereignties is not very easy uh, does not make it easy to handle overlapping spaces, cross-border spaces, and particularly the platforms, who now are serving hundreds of millions of people across borders. But in a certain way, and he uh, recapped some of the discussions that have been taking place in the multilateral environment, uh, at the moment, for people who like me and, and others in this room, have been following these discussions for the last 10 to 15 years, those who were at the end of the World Summit on the Information Society in 2005 and saw the negotiation of the documents see that in the following 10 years, none of the declarations that have been adopted basically went anywhere further than the formulations that were adopted in 2005, and certainly not in the direction of having operational mechanisms. So without discarding the multilateral institutions that exist, they are hampered by a certain number of things, including the fact that just to put a topic on the agenda, you need a consensus of all the member states that are part of these organizations. And this usually delays the problem very long. The other instrument to take one particular topic uh, that is available is usually bilateral agreements. And uh, there was uh, a hint at the question of multi, uh, mutual legal assistance treaties. Uh, I can elaborate later on. The problem with mutual legal assistance treaties today is that I often qualify them as the uh, switch network of international cooperation. If you want something that scales up and you get 190 countries, this means 17,000 uh, bilateral agreements. And so this is simply not scalable. We need another type of thing. And I know that there are discussions underway at the moment to try to reform the MLAT system. So, the problem is that in this context, the multilateral system at best is slow. And if I take one example, which is the Budapest Convention, which is considered as one of the most advanced operational uh, mechanisms, it took four years to negotiate, but it took 10 years to put the topic on the agenda. And so any multilateral effort that would be uh, undertaken would in any case be extremely long, if at all it would work. And so, in this, in this context, multilateral approach is uh, not very useful, or at least doesn't include the different stakeholders that we need. The bilateral arrangements are difficult to reform, and so what is happening is what I often qualify as a legal arms race, i.e. unilateral decisions by the different governments who legitimately have to handle the issues of misuse. And so the problem is not so much that there is an exercise of national sovereignty, which by definition is legitimate. The problem is that the uncoordinated multiplication of those initiatives produce a system or a situation that makes the problem harder to solve than providing a solution. And in particular, you know how difficult it is to harmonize ex post. And when you have a proliferation of national decisions, we are getting into something that is a quite dangerous path that has detrimental effects potentially economically, creating new barriers to entry, for instance, in uh, data localization uh, laws. You have dangers in terms of uh, human rights because there is a potential race to the bottom in, takes, uh, in terms of what is uh, going to be accepted or not accepted on, online. You have technical infrastructure uh, challenges 
<coughs> for instance, if uh, the filtering by IP addresses is being generalized, we get in a situation where those very IP addresses could become distributed on a national basis and attached to individual devices, making this an identifier that actually could increase surveillance, for instance. Uh, there's another element regarding the infrastructure that I care very much about, which is that the DNS layer is a neutral layer and should remain so. It is not a content control panel, and there's an increased pressure on this layer to become a content control panel. And there are also issues of security because uh, on the one hand, the proliferation of national decisions uncoordinated puts everybody in a prisoner's dilemma and provides uh, incoherences. But the lack and the absence of mechanisms for dealing with law enforcement cooperation, for dealing with security issues, could produce what I've sometimes labeled the risk of digital rondas, where basically mass um, slaughter or mass massacre for ethnic, religious, uh, political purposes or reasons could be triggered by the use of those tools. And so, in light of this situation, we're confronted with what is actually an institutional gap. For the governance of the internet, we do have an ecosystem of governance. We have a range of institutions that include the IETF, the World Wide Web Consortium, the um, uh, regional internet registries distributing IP addresses, you get ICANN, you get a range of institutions that basically have functioned pretty well and brought this internet to the several billions of users that we have today. Unfortunately, to use the word of uh, Laura Donardis in one article, the ecosystem for governance on the internet is incomplete and as she said, inchoate, which actually taught me a, a word that I find very elegant. So, inchoate means that it is incomplete. We do have the internet um, governance forum, which I consider in many respects as the main outcome of the uh, uh, World Summit on the Information Society. <clears throat> I like the IGF very much. I think it is the annual watering hole and it has demonstrated that it is the annual watering hole where everybody can come on an equal footing to discuss what is at stake, what they're doing, and where they go. The problem is that in spite of a lot of efforts, and I, I commend here uh, in particular the fact that the Internet Society has been very active in trying to make the uh, intercessional work uh, develop through the mechanism of best practices forum. Still, we do not have with the IGF mechanisms for intercessional work that go in the direction of producing actual operational solutions for the different issues. And if we want to develop international or transnational cooperation systems, we need to have places for the different actors to be together. And so we need mechanisms that are multi-stakeholder because there's no way those solutions will be found without the involvement of the private actors and civil society and academia and the technical operators as well as governments. There needs to be ongoing discussions because uh, I'm, like you are, participating or attending in several conferences, but none of the key policy issues are going to be solved by a succession of two-hour panels. There's no way it can be done. You need ongoing process and you need secretariats to support this work. And, um, and finally, this uh, mechanism needs to be oriented towards operational solution and providing a common understanding on what the problems are. So, to finish basically on, on this, and you might find it actually in the, in the little uh, card that was distributed when, when you came in, the challenge is how to develop transnational mechanisms that are as, diver as distributed and as participatory as the internet itself and as the governance of the internet ecosystem uh, is. And in that regard, drawing from the experience in the limited uh, scope of activities that we're developing in the internet and jurisdiction project, we can draw the following ideas. We have focused with the help, or we are facilitating dialogue between those actors, and what has emerged is the increased number of direct requests that are being sent by public authorities in one country 
to private actors in another country for domain seizures, content takedown, and access to user data. And what is at stake here is to develop frameworks that provide procedural interoperability. Harmonization on substance is extremely difficult. And the first step to get into the solution for those things is to develop procedures, to develop formats for requests, to develop elements in those requests that embed due process across borders by design. And this notion of procedural interoperability is something that is actually the first step into getting shared regimes and shared uh, solutions. The last element is that the tools for doing this and for embedding those um, solutions are difficult to find because today we have tools that are either intergovernmental agreements, which are very heavy, very cumbersome, sometimes difficult to update, and are usually negotiated only among governments. On the other hand, you have sometimes best practices guidelines by uh, the private actors, or you have declarations by civil society, like the necessary and proportionate, for instance. But we do not have at the moment any type of new format for agreements new type of multi-stakeholder regimes that embed the principles, norms, rules, decision-making procedures and programs that solve a particular issue. And in that regard, without drawing too many analogies, it is very interesting to look at the case in ICANN of what has been established with the UDRP, which is actually leveraging the uni Uniform Dispute Resolution Procedure, which actually takes a leverage from the terms of service of the registries and registrars. And what we're witnessing in the space of the large platforms and the major internet operators is that their terms of service and their community guidelines are actually providing a normative angle on what is allowed or not allowed on those spaces and that the procedures through which they accept or not accept and process the request that they receive is actually going to be determining, in a large respect, the balance of rights and the guarantee of due process across borders. So I, I finish with this. What is at stake is creating ongoing, multi-stakeholder, and a point I didn't mention, on an issue-by-issue -issue basis, dialogues, getting the different stakeholders around the table to find operational solutions. And one of the big challenges is that this approach, which is an implementation of the multi-stakeholder approach, is, could be labeled as um, an approach like bottom-up policy startup. And the whole ecosystem for facilitating the initiation, the support, and the growth of initiatives like that, including in terms of human and financial resources, is not in place at the moment. But I do believe very strongly that developing issue-based networks that facilitate the dialogue between the relevant stakeholders internationally on specific issues is the right way to go rather than the creation of one institution or one process that would deal with the, uh, the whole of internet issues. The governance of the internet is distributed, multi-stakeholder on an issue-by-issue -issue basis the governance on the internet should function exactly in the same way. I liked your comment about it being the uh, annual watering hole because I used to have an executive who referred to ICANN meetings as the bar at Star Wars. Um, <laughs> but going back, uh, it's interesting because you guys have taken sort of you know similar principles of being in uh, <coughs> Larry, you it took them and took them kind of internally where um, the challenge seems to be internationally, but I'm just a moment to go kind of a little parochial. It sounds like you saw the multi-stakeholder process and you've utilized it in other issue sets at NTIA, and I, from what I can tell, you seem to be having pretty good success with that. Do you feel like, you know, with you mentioned um, privacy, drones, uh, intellectual property? Um, I think we are performing an important service by utilizing the mechanisms. Um, these are 
for people who don't come out of the ICANN world, and many of you in the audience are feel quite familiar with ICANN and familiar with how the multi-stakeholder model works there, um, but if you don't have that background, uh, you are dealing with some alien concepts for people because particularly in this city, you're dealing with people who are, you know, have built careers on their ability to get things done or to stop things from happening on Capitol Hill. Or know how to and file a report at the FCC yeah, and no one else and, does, and right? <laughs> people who know how to play the regulatory game. So we are getting people to try to develop new skills. Um, and that's always a, a challenge when you're dealing with a group of people who have um, in large part dealt with a particular way of responding to things in the legal regulatory world. And now you're saying, well, hey, try something new. So. Um, I do think that the people who have come through our processes who hadn't seen this before um, have, a, have a lot of respect for how this happens. Um, I think that we've shown a lot of promise in utilizing these uh, tools in order to make progress where there is little hope of seeing legislative or regulatory progress being made. Um, and we're hoping that we can embed a sense that this is a mechanism and, and this is a set of tools that people ought to pick up on their own and utilize. They don't need to have NTIA convening people to sit down and solve problems. It goes to what Bertrand said. It's people coming together to solve problems. But maybe we've uh, uh, sowed enough seeds of this that it'll be something that can uh, last beyond uh, the end of this year. But we're going to keep uh, pursuing it. Um, and, and I think, you know, we have seen a, a good response to the different topics that we've put out there. Um, and we're, we're going to continue to press forward with these in the existing uh, topics. And hopefully we'll add some more topics this year as well. Thanks. And Matron, so I, what I find interesting is, so obviously um, NTIA had some issues in front of them that they were like, well, we can solve this for you or you guys can get in a room and work it out and we'll put an you know, open dialogue on the Internet and we can talk about it. Um, when you're looking at the set of issues that, and I understand that not all of them are ICANN or ITF you know, related as they're going forward, how much of that is a learning process to understand what this multi-stakeholder concept is and, and what are they giving up for what are they getting? Because I, I get it from a parochial perspective from NTIA. I'm, I'm curious from an international perspective. Well, I think there's, there's a very uh, interesting element, which is we, we are using the expression the multi-stakeholder model. Um, let me rephrase this uh, slightly. I believe that the multi-stakeholder approach can be summarized in one, one sentence. It is the right for any person or entity to participate in an appropriate manner in the governance discussions that deal with the issues that they are impacted by or that they impact. The moment you say that, it is a participatory principle and it can, as Larry said, be applied in many, in many kind of spaces. The other element, so this is a fundamental definition as far as I'm concerned uh, in my understanding of the multi-stakeholder approach. The second element is if you look at the governance of the internet ecosystem, institutional ecosystem, there are many different implementations of the multi-stakeholder model. ICANN doesn't function like the IETF nor like the IIRs, nor like the W3C. Yet, they're all based on a certain number of implementation of the principle that I was highlighting. They have mechanisms for putting something on the agenda. They have mechanisms for drafting the uh, recommendations. They have mechanisms for validation. Then mechanisms for implementation and mechanisms for review and redress. And those five stages of initiation and issue framing, drafting, validation, implementation and redress, you find in every single governance system. And the problem we have at the moment is that in governance on the internet, we barely have the first one. The IGF is producing a bit of the issue framing, but we don't have the drafting mechanisms, we don't have the validation mechanisms, we don't have the implementation at all, and let alone appeals and redress. And I want to take an example. Um, when we talk about representative democracy, we don't talk about a model of representative democracy. Because if you look at the United States, France, Germany, the UK, just those four countries, they have very, very different ways of implementing representative democracies. 
there are many elements that are similar, but the balance of power between the different structures are different. And so when we talk, take lessons from the internet, um, the governance of the internet ecosystem, and try to transpose it into the governance on the internet to create the new ecosystem or the enhancement of the ecosystem, it is not a copy and paste. We need to be inventive and, and find new mechanisms. And the last point in that, in that regard is, in the debate between multilateral and multi-stakeholder, I personally witnessed the, the functioning and the efforts, the very sincere efforts, that organizations like the OECD or the Council of Europe are making to involve the other stakeholders. And in my five stages, if in the end, the validation of something requires the role of governments, or the validation requires a particular role for the private actors, it will vary according to the issue. And so when, for instance, the Council of Europe sets up a working group, as they are now doing again, I participated in the first one, and I will participate as a member in a 13 people um, working group that will deal with the issue of the responsibility and liability of intermediaries. This group is going to be bringing together governments and stakeholders and other actors from business and from uh, civil society. And this will prepare a potential recommendation by the, uh, the committee of ministers. But the committee of ministers will not be drafting the thing. The thing will be prepared by a multi-stakeholder effort. Likewise for the OECD, it was not perfect, but at least their effort in developing the principles a couple of years ago was involving the other stakeholders. So I think if you keep in mind this notion that there are five stages and that basically the participation of the different stakeholders can vary according to the issue, the convener, and the stages, you get a much more flexible tool set to develop tools. But to answer directly your question, yes, we are inventing a new way to, to, to deal with those things on topics that have not been necessarily explored in that way so far. But just like Larry was mentioning that it can be transposed at the national level in other topics, I believe that the space of internet governance is a laboratory for issues that are much broader than that. And that the same methodology, the same approach, the same thinking, if we prove that it works here, may be used in other topics, in environment, in the management of common resources, and, and so on. But at first, we need to prove that it works on this space because it is one of the laboratories. So going back to my policy petri dish over here. So the first time you guys did this outside of the ICANN sphere was privacy, I believe. And was it a little angst-ridden? People weren't sure this was a new process. And then once you got them comfortable with it, I'm not sure that you had the same five that Bertrand's you know, pointing out. But so let's say we, you got the privacy one going. You had pretty good uptick with that. And I'm going to guess was drones next, I think. So the, the, uh, the second one was facial recognition. And there oh, right, we hit right. a road bump because we had a, you know, a group of stakeholders who decided they'd rather do nothing than to continue to discuss in a room where they felt they weren't being listened to. Um, we still hope they come back um, <laughs> because the process will be stronger with them in the process. And it's not like they have an alternative place to go to particularly. Um, but, um, uh, but it is important to keep people engaged in these things. I, I wanted to come back on a comment Bertrand made though. Um, I mean, I've heard this construct of government of the or governance of the internet and governance on the internet and I know Bertrand's used it and, and other folks have used it out there um, I'm not yet convinced that's a, a, a satisfactory distinction to be making because I, at the end of the day I think what it comes down to is whatever the issue is you're taking on it's more who is the appropriate convener for it. And I think, you know, we certainly when we're dealing with the technical aspects of the internet, the conveners are already in place and they're known, IETF, ICANN, um, or pieces of ICANN, uh, affiliations with ICANN. When we get into these other issues, it, the convener isn't as clear, but that doesn't mean that the convener is well-defined and, and, and only certain people can play that role. And I think that's part of what you're seeing with the Net Mundial initiative is that there you had um, 
at least a group of people come together representing various interests and to try to determine, okay, how do we go about becoming a convener for getting people to bring issues and, and structuring multi-stakeholder discussions around it? And there really has been zero uptake of the, of the uh, structure in terms of performing that particular role. Um, but that doesn't mean there was anything invalid about the effort to do it. Lots of criticism about the processes used, but um, but it comes back to my point, which is you, you, what you need to get these things going is you need to have a convener that people will uh, come behind and support and say, yeah, that sounds like a worthy discussion to have and I want to participate in it. And so I don't think it matters at that point whether it's on the internet, off the internet, in the internet, above the internet, below the internet. It really comes down to um, how do you find a convener that has the, a, enough respect and enough pull that it'll attract the kind of discussion you want to have on these issues. Do you think Net Mundial was a bit of a, a takeaway for one year from the Internet Governance Forum and the IGF after WISIS now has the respect of those and they can fold that back in? Or it, it seemed to me like they were competing a little bit for the same molecule of oxygen. But the governments were trying to figure out where they fit in and they wanted their own party and nobody was going to pay for it but themselves so they might go back to the annual watering hole. So I think it'll be an important discussion this year to talk about the relationship of Net Mundial Initiative and IGF, and is there a way to, uh, is there something additional that, um, having gone through the, the Net Mundial Initiative process, that can now be brought back into the IGF context? I think that's a very um, useful and important conversation to have this year, and I expect um, folks will be having it. Other than additional governments in um, Net Mundial, what is the difference? I'm sorry. What, well, what is, is the difference between Net Mundial and IGF Internet Governance? The, the Net Mundial Initiative. Yeah. Um, well, it 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 was born out of the Net Mundial outcome document, so it does have a grounding in the principles that were laid down back in 2014 in Brazil. And I think that's part of the question, which is, is there something um, organic coming out of that document that is worth preserving? in some fashion, um, and, and if that is, can it be done in the context of the IGF, or does it need a standalone uh, body within which to pursue those issues? I think that's the debate people have been having. Okay, any thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I'd like to, 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 uh, to piggyback on what Larry uh, just said. Uh, first of all, on the distinction between off and on, I think the way we can converge is basically there are some topics where the convener exists. They are there. They've emerged as the need arose in the course of time on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. And when you want to deal with a particular topic, you go to that one. What I label more or less the issue of governance on the Internet is a range of issues for which the convener is not obvious. And there's the fight of whether it's an international organization that exists that picks it up or if you need to create something completely different. But let me take one very concrete example regarding ICANN. I mentioned earlier in the, uh, in the presentation that the DNS layer is a neutral layer and that it should be preserved as a neutral layer. There is currently an important pressure regarding the seizure of domain names that is being put on ICANN because there is precisely no alternative place to discuss this. And I think a lot of people agree that ICANN's mandate as a limited remit should remain on the technical operations and all those things, which begets the question of where do you address the other ones, knowing that there are some voluntary um, processes that are being put in place. The uh, anti-phishing working group, for instance, is a very good initiative that has uh, provided some elements of solution. But generalizing this, if there is not a parallel space or a parallel convening power that allows the stakeholders to discuss the issues related to when can a domain name be uh, seized because of content that is below, then the pressure will come on ICANN and because it's the place where the actors are. And so this distinction is about where to bring the discussions beyond the existing institutions if we want them to remain at the uh, technical level. And that brings the questions that you raise. One, the question of the convener. The traditional way of doing international cooperation is to have existing international organizations with very specific mandates, get UNESCO on science, culture, and so on, 
the World Trade Organization on trade, the WIPO on intellectual property, and you can go on and on. The problem is that most of the issues that we're trying to deal with, they overlap those uh, institutions. And each of them is very legitimately beginning to discuss them, but every time they are bound by the mandate that they have. And so where do they get together? And in the Internet and Jurisdiction Project, we made a big effort to involve the secretariat of those organizations to make sure that there was a form of coherence and coordination among what is happening there. The core element about the convener is that it can be almost anybody provided one fundamental criteria, which is neutrality. This is absolutely fundamental and essential. And if there is a neutrality and a sincere effort by whatever group, small or large, to say, we think there is a topic there, the relevant stakeholders should be around the table, and we will play a facilitation role, then people will come. It's a little bit like in the ITF, the birds of a feather concept. You call for a first meeting, and if people come and say, well, yeah, we find this topic important for us, and the ones that I mentioned around jurisdiction, I can tell you that all the different stakeholders consider that it is an important topic for them for various reasons. If there is one actor that takes the flag and says, we're going to facilitate the discussion, people are willing to come and participate. The key, um, the key element in that, in that regard is we are, as we said before, developing those procedures. And when we say relevant stakeholders, to echo once again what Larry was saying, there are two challenges in who is around the table. Or actually, there are three. One is how to make sure that the ones who need to be there, that must be there for the topic to be addressed, are there. How can you force them, quote unquote, how do you entice them to be around the table because they do have an impact on the topic and if they are not there, anything that is being discussed will not work. The, river, the flip side of this is how do you make sure that those who do not have necessarily the means to participate because of cost, because of time and so on, are included or their perspectives are included in a certain way. And the final and most important element is what are the procedures for this? And even I can, after more than um, 15 years, uh, 18 years, is struggling with how to manage the, the discussions through the very cumbersome and traditional tools of mailing lists. And uh, I, don't, I see smiles on, on, on people who manage or participate actively in the CWG and CCWG. This is a real problem. What are the procedures? How to make sure that no voice is overbearing? How to make sure that the facilitation actually enforces the common formulation and the common vernacular? We're learning as we, as we go. And in that regard, the, um, the, the, the role of the, uh, the conveners is important. Final point on the Net Mundial. I find the... Um, the opposition between the Net Mundial uh, event and the IGF particularly unfair because the Net Mundial event in Sao Paulo could never have taken place without the IGF before. People would not have been able to stay in the same room without nameplates, without a particular segment for the different stakeholders. I personally moderated two sessions at the IGF before the Net Mundial on the range of declarations of principles that had been adopted by an incredible number of actors. And everybody at the IGF agreed that, yes, there was a huge convergence and it would be great to have one single document. And so what happened is that Brazil said, listen, I will plant the flag and I will take the initiative of convening people to try to develop what everybody seems to be ready to do. And they did it. And now it feeds into the IGF very nicely because it has been a product and it was the first time that there was an attempt at drafting something in a multi-stakeholder manner. And uh, the, the, the format that was used is something that I qualify as a fishbowl format, where you have a drafting team that is in a room, and everybody is watching exactly how the drafting team is functioning. And it was really fun. And it was actually not perfect, but it really proved that it is possible to develop something in this way. And coming back to my five stages, this was the first time that 
The second leg, which is drafting, was tested in a multi-stakeholder manner in a non-pre-existing institution. And I think it's very positive. Now, the Net Mondial Initiative was the next attempt to say exactly what I was saying earlier. We need to facilitate policy making from the bottom up through what I sometimes label as policy startups, as I'm trying to uh, experiment on my, on my own. And we do not have a mechanism and a system that facilitates the emergence of those things, that nurtures the conveners who want to take a topic, that supports them. And I think one of the objectives, maybe not completely fulfilled, but the, one of the objectives that the Net Mondial Initiative um, had and still has, is to catalyze and support policy initiatives that come from the bottom up. Where they go afterwards is depending on the issue. It might go and be transferred into an international organization. It can be institutionalized in a certain way. In a certain way. Nobody knows. But nurturing the ecosystem for the emergence of those bottom-up policy initiatives at the transnational level, and I insist on transnational, not international level. What we need is transnational cooperation, not international, i.e. intergovernmental only. Transnational cooperation is the way to go, and we need policy startups to do this. So maybe Net Mundial was just a very large intersectional. No, <laughs> I don't think it's a good analogy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just, uh, um, we're a bit out of time, so I'm going to do one last question, Another which remote um, are, never they, back. They, we did not. We're not able to get the remote participants back, but because today has been an abbreviated um, session, we have promised that we're going to take these issues and bring them into this year's agenda. So this is not the last time you'll be able to talk about these delightful topics. But um, one of the things you said in your your um, initial discussion was that there were certain things that particular groups were able to coalesce around that others haven't found that. And you talked about the and specifically the registries and registrars. And it seemed to me that that is because they have to abide by contract law. They are getting into a contractual obligation. So they've all agreed to their, their points of you know what they're doing. And, and they're also businesses. Um, are there, there are certain things that you think will be able to drive the other elements of these into this into an ongoing dialogue? Or is this going to continue to be a, a push effort to try to keep the multi-stakeholder from going um, multilateral? You put your finger on a very important element. Yes, there's an element of constraint that is a tit for tat. If you don't agree, um, then you will not get the contract. And if you don't put it in the contract, um, you're done. You cannot exercise your, your, your activity. Uh, it is true that on some of the other issues, there's no such higher authority that can impose anything. So the only way to do this and this again comes to the role of the convener slash facilitator, is to help the different actors get out of the traditional game theory prisoner's dilemma. At the moment, every single actor in the absence of international cooperation is forced to take initiatives. And because they are doing this on the basis of the information that they have and their own interest, they naturally take a decision that is uh, short-term direct interest. It may have unintended consequences when you pile them up and when everybody is doing decisions in their own. So getting the different actors together is a way to turn the situation and to transform a problem that they believe they have with each other into a problem that they actually have in common. The two issues that I mentioned at the very beginning, how to preserve the cross-border nature of the internet while respecting national laws, i.e., how do you organize the coexistence of national laws in shared online spaces. This is a common problem for everyone. Likewise, how to fight misuses and abuses while respecting human rights and so on. I'm sorry, it's a common problem. How they organize this and whether there is a way for them to have a sort of non-zero sum game and positive sum game may not work all the time. But at the moment, that's the best we have. And Larry, in your opening comments, you mentioned um, who gets to decide do you think that we have, we've done this long enough now, I guess, depending on which one you're counting on, 10, 15 years, that people feel pretty confident that this is the way we should be making decisions going forward with not only the internet, but as you've demonstrated, other, other issues of government? Oh, I, without question. Um, I mean, the, the benefits of this approach, again, compared to any other, are 
speed, flexibility, responsiveness, uh, the ability to solve a problem that's still a problem when you come up with the answer as opposed to the alternative processes that yield results that by the time you get them, they, the problem you were trying to fix doesn't exist anymore. So I don't think there's any question about the superiority of this form of uh, uh, attacking and dealing with problems. Um, the challenge is finding the legit legitimacy around it um, so that people accept these outcomes and are able to take action on them. Again, it's worked out incredibly well in the technical space of the internet. And the question is, how do we build that legitimacy on these other issues where there are other people who are basically saying, well, that's my decision to make, not, and I don't really care what um, all these other stakeholders think. So I think that's really the, the, the threshold question we're facing on as we try to expand this process beyond where it exists today. Great. Thank you both for a really enlightened conversation. Um, apologies to, to George and Sally. We will get you into another dialogue on this soon. And uh, please help me in thanking our panelists.